In thinking about a lecturer for this year's series, we were drawn to Dr. Rod Wilson, the president of Regent College in Vancouver. We were delighted that he has accepted our invitation. Rod's capacity to speak to the issues of the day related to pastoral care and, and the personhood of the pastoral caregiver is not only found in his professional competence. He is a clinical psychologist and counselor. He has served on the staff of two churches in Toronto as well as being a teaching pastor. Additionally, he has served as professor, dean of students and academic dean at Tyndale University College and Seminary in Toronto. He was there from 1978 to 1995. He is currently the president of Regent College in Vancouver, a position he has held since the year 2000. His qualifications to speak to us go beyond his academic credibility. He is a person who has lived life just like the rest of us, but it is a life that is firmly rooted in faith in Jesus Christ and with the confidence that he is the one who brings integration and healing to human beings. He comes to us tonight as a disciple a follower of Jesus Christ. Gail and I had the opportunity to meet him and his wife Bev, and she's with him this evening. We're glad you're both here with us. We had the opportunity to hear Rod speak at the Fellowship of Evangelical Seminary Presidents a couple of years ago on the topic of rhythm, balance, solitude, and rest, issues related to the soul of our leadership. We were helped by his presentation and so were the others, so much so that he was invited back the next year. So who knows what will happen in this series. Knowing that all of you are interested in books, and I've seen some of you already at the book table, uh, we have available there books from this year's lecturer and also books from several of our own professors at the college. Rod was born in Dublin, Ireland, and he and Bev had their evening meal with Andrew and Jean McRae, who are here tonight, the Irish and the Scots. We have an ongoing, interesting, and warm-hearted and very Christian exchange between some Scots and the English, so perhaps it was wise tonight to simply have the Irish and the Scots to begin. I want to extend a very warm welcome to you both, to Rod and to Bev. We are delighted, as I've said, to have you with us. We look forward, Rod, to your message this evening, your lecture. After that, there will be a brief question and answer period and the opportunity for some fellowship and to enjoy refreshments. So, Rod, I would welcome you. If you would please join me here at the podium. I want to have the opportunity to pray with you as you come to us, and after that, uh, please begin, but let us pray together. God of grace and glory, grant Rod a clear mind, an overflowing of your love, and the ability to communicate what he has prepared for us. Give us open hearts and minds to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you join me in giving Rod Wilson a warm Atlantic Baptist welcome? Thank you, Harry, for that uh, kind introduction. I appreciate it. I was with my colleague, uh, J.I. Packer, in Hong Kong a few years ago, and after uh, he was introduced, he stood up and said, uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, and God forgive me for enjoying it so much, uh, which I won't say that tonight. And I am glad that uh, my roots in Dublin were noted, and uh, Scotland being a suburb of Dublin, it was nice to... Uh, 
meet with one of the suburban uh, Irish people uh, tonight in the McCrae's and enjoy their hospitality. Uh, Bev and I are very glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad I was announced from Dublin because I spent uh, four years in Dublin, uh, 48 in Toronto, and 11 in Vancouver. Uh, and those of you who are poor with math, I will be 59 shortly. Um, but I find in Vancouver when I say I'm from Toronto, people act very strange with me. And uh, I've found since I've been in Nova Scotia, if I say I'm from Toronto, people act strange as well. So if you wonder where I'm from, I'm from uh, Dublin. <laughs> That's where I'm from. I appreciate the invitation and the generosity uh, extended by Gerald Simpson to make uh, these lectures possible. And uh, also am excited about the array of things that are offered this week. I feel for those of you who are not from away, uh, I'm aware of my CFA status being here, but uh, for those of you who are not from away and leading seminars and doing things this week, I trust God blesses you and those of us who listen and uh, look forward to what God may do this week uh, through all of us as we meet together on this subject. Um, I don't know what your reaction to the term lecture is, uh, my own experience with lectures is it's often synonymous with inaccessible, with minimal application. Uh, I've been to many lectureships in my life, and uh, we're going to have a pause here. Uh, I just have to make one announcement, sorry. That's all right. Uh, we have a car that needs to be moved. Sorry for this interruption. It's a Kia Sorento. EBG199, and don't give the person too hard a time when they get up to go out okay. and move their car, okay? So that's a Kia Sorento, EBG199. Maybe we could turn the camera around and get them as they're leaving. Uh, every time those announcements happen, nobody leaves. Have you noticed that? But lectures often are synonymous with uh, the inaccessible, that people can't understand what was being said, and with minimal application to life. Or, uh, my experience with some people who've been in pastoral ministry at lectures is often it's another occasion to preach sermons, and it's not a lecture either. Uh, so I'm never quite sure with genre uh, what one does in three nights like this. Does one preach uh, sermons as one word in a church, or does one give inaccessible lectures? Uh, but what I would like to do tonight is steer in a slightly different direction from the sermonic or from the inaccessible lecture and invite you to look through uh, three windows around the subject of identity. I'm assuming all of you have the sheet uh, in front of you that will summarize what I'm going to say tonight and those of you who come back tomorrow as well as those of you who come back on Wednesday will uh, get sheets those two nights as well. Uh, but I want to talk about this uh, subject that I think is difficult for many of us for many different reasons as we look at the topic of identity. Windows, metaphorically, uh, are usually understood as a way to look out. In fact, most of us, I think, when we think of the windows uh, in our homes, uh, we think of an opportunity to view that which is on the outside, and it's kind of a trajectory outward. Windows also have the effect of enabling us to look in. And what we're going to do in these three nights is look in, inside the life of the pastor. I'm going to talk about pastors uh, in the nomenclature that I use throughout these three nights, not as exclusive to those who hold the office of the pastor or those who are in uh, pastoral ministry as we understand it, but for all of us who have pastoral responsibilities. So if you hear the term pastor, I trust you will give it a, a large P and a small P as we look together at it. My fear in looking in the window, you will know that if you start looking in the windows in your neighborhood, the police will co probably come along and arrest you because that is a criminal activity in most provinces in Canada. Uh, most of us are used to looking out the window and having a trajectory looking at what we're doing and looking at where we're going. It seems to me in pastoral ministry, particularly in the current context, so many pastors are bombarded with what they're supposed to do. And if you've been in pastoral ministry, you've carried that weight, I suspect in a very heavy way, of all the expectations, uh, both from inside of you as well as from externally, of how you're supposed to function, how you're supposed to behave, how you're supposed to perform. To talk about identity is really to look at the insight and ask the question, what is behind what you're doing? 
does not mean that all pastoral ministry is that way. It does not mean that all of what we're talking about in these times together in these three nights is all there is to pastoral ministry. But it seems to me many of us in this room, including the person speaking, need to roll the baby blues around and look at what is driving our activity and our behavior. The propensity to burnout, uh, both real burnout and con contrived burnout, uh, in the culture, and particularly amongst those in pastoral ministry, is often not related to what people do, but in fact what drives what they do. Or, to use other language, the identity behind the performance. And so we're going to look through three different windows. On Wednesday night, we're going to look through the performance window and try to understand the role of Sabbath as a formative identity in the life of a pastor. Tomorrow night, we're going to look through the professional window and look at that very difficult subject for Christians, and I suggest to you particularly for evangelical Christians, the window of competence. What does it mean to be competent as a pastor? And tonight, I want to look through a more personal window at our identity as it relates to our understanding of grace. Now, one of the problems in theological curriculums, it seems to me, and being the president of a theological school and a sister school to Acadia Divinity School, I can say this, one of the problems with academic curriculums in the theological realm is often theology trumps everything. The theologians in the group are quietly saying amen and hallelujah to that. But theology trumps everything with the unfortunate byproduct that biography gets lost. And one of the advantages of being in your sixth decade, a phrase my wife deeply dislikes, when you're in your sixth decade and you've seen lots of people fall, lots of people go through moral difficulties, lots of people go through uh, removals from ministry, I don't know what they call it here, provinces I've lived in, they call it God calling people elsewhere, which is often a synonym for any number of things, including firing and dismissal and all those other things. But often when people leave, what is actually going on is their biography is playing a much bigger role than their theology. They're not questioning the virgin birth. They're not debating uh, forensic or filial views of atonement. They're not trying to deal with questions of justification. They're not, nobody in the congregation saying, do you hold an N.T. right view in heaven or not? It's usually about biography. It's usually about something in their own life. It's interesting, chronologically, biography, in fact, precedes theology. As we grow and develop, uh, we develop biographically. And our theology is often layered on top of that. And the deep convictions we hold as adults, theologically, is embedded upon our biological story and our own narrative. And if you've worked with people who are Christian before, and I suspect most of you have, you will notice that most of them don't get in trouble in their theology, they get in trouble in their biography. Their own story, its brokenness, its frailty, its difficulties, is what gets them in trouble. And yet many theological curriculums pay very little attention to biography and focus primarily on expertise in theology and all that goes with it, all the relevant curriculum that's attached to it. And yet if you've taught at Acadia Divinity School or some other divinity school or theological seminary, you will know that most of the students you know who've kind of flamed out or burned out or rusted out have done that because of some aspect of their own story that's been really problematic. In fact, you've been heard to say, I don't understand it. They've been so faithful, and they're so convicted about their theological understanding, I don't understand why they have so much trouble. Their biography has got in the way of their theology. Now, I recognize when the first quote in a Baptist audience is to quote Calvin, uh, some of you may be uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's already on your sheet, and it's hard to avoid it. But I want to quote from Calvin's Institutes right at the beginning, and I would encourage you to follow this quote and listen to what Calvin said. True and substantial wisdom principally consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Almost all the things we know, the good things, the true things, center on two kinds of knowledge what we know about God, and what we know about ourselves. But while these two branches of knowledge are so intimately connected, which of them precedes or produces the other is not easy to discover. 
And so by our imperfections, we are excited to a consideration of the perfections of God. Nor can we really aspire toward him till we have begun to be displeased with ourselves. For who would not gladly rest satisfied with himself or herself? Where is the man or the woman not actually absorbed in self-complacency while he remains unacquainted with his true situation or content with his own endowments and ignorant or forgetful of his own misery? The knowledge of ourselves, therefore, is not only an incitement to seek after God, but likewise a considerable assistance towards finding him. And those of you who study theology will know Calvin's double knowledge, knowledge of God and knowledge of self, need to inform our understanding of the Christian life. And what I want to do for the rest of the time as we talk in these lectures is use that motif of knowledge of God and knowledge of self as a way to unpack pastoral identity. I want to go back and talk about my experience in elementary school. It's contradiction for a speaker to say we're going to talk about biography and not tell a little of biography. So I'm going to tell a bit of my biography. One of my strongest memories in elementary school was doing speeches in front of the entire school. I remember standing up front in grade three, grade four, and giving speeches to the whole school. I don't remember a lot about the speeches. I don't remember a lot about the event, but I do remember preparing for them. I remember being at home with my parents, both of them working hard with me to make sure we had very good speeches that were very articulate, no ums and ahs or bad use of grammar, but great clarity, great preparation, and good presentation. That was really, really important in grade three. <laughs> how well you did was based on how people responded. Not faithfulness, but in how well people responded. In fact, the way you knew if you had done well was how people responded to what you did. I remember one particular night preparing a metaphor in grade three or four for how we were going to describe darkness falling in this particular speech. And one of the three of us, I can't remember which one it was, came up with the idea that we should talk about darkness descending like an airplane on the runway. You can ooh and ah if you want. It's pretty good for elementary school. This was a very powerful metaphor, very powerful motif. Darkness descending like an airplane on a runway. And I remember memorizing that line and making sure the cadence was right. Darkness descending like an airplane on a runway. And the test as to whether that was a good line or an effective line, the test was, how did people respond to that? Not was it a good line, no sense of vertical accountability, faithfulness to God, that didn't even enter into it. It was all about how well people respond. You worked hard to get a good response from other people. My father died of four heart attacks, the last three of which were on his way to work after the doctor had told him not to keep working. My mother worked full-time till she was 79. Stopped working, not because she had to stop working, but because the company went out of business. Uh, they rebranded, got out of bankruptcy, and asked her if she'd come back when she was 82 to be the office manager. That's my mother. Between the three children in the family, I'm the oldest of three, we have 10 degrees. Work matters. Work counts. And work is about achieving the acceptance of others. That's why you work. That's the purpose of work. That's my biography. While I've got theological training and understand theology and could preach many, many sermons on the subject of grace, I have absolutely no clue, as a Wilson, what grace means. My biography and my theological understanding of grace have been in great consternation and battle with one another for 58 years. Because my biography tells me exactly the opposite of what my Bible tells me 
about the subject of grace. In sum, that's my biography on this topic. Now, for those of you who just woke up, <laughs> Meryl Streep has not become a pastor in Halifax, okay? <laughs> for those of you looking at the notes. But I want to talk about Meryl Streep. If you've watched Meryl Streep in movies and have seen her experience in movies and seen how she's functioned in movies and then watched her interviewed, you've probably had the same experience as I have. When I watch Meryl Streep interviewed, I'm more and more impressed with her as an actor. She has played so many diverse parts, very serious parts, very dramatic parts, very humorous parts. Those of you who saw Mamma Mia, it's hard to believe that was, that was Meryl Streep. Uh, singing in that movie. Very strange, very odd. But her craft and the way she carries her craft is d demonstrated in a powerful way when you see her interviewed. Because when you see her interviewed, you realize the way she acts is not at all like she is. And the reason that impresses us so much, of course, is because we know that actors are at their best when they're lost in the role and are not themselves. That's when actors are their best. They're lost in the role and they're not themselves. And the juxtaposition between an actor who's been interviewed and an actor in a movie and the gap between those often defines the quality and the expertise of the actor. Sometimes you see some B-level actors interviewed and they sound exactly like they do in the movie you just saw. And that's why they're called B-actors. But the good actors, those are people who can take who they are and put it aside and can lose themselves in the role to such a degree that who they are does not matter. Persons, it seems to me, are at their best when they're not absorbed with their role and are themselves. Now you see the tension, I think, for many of us in this realm of how we engage in leadership, how we engage in pastoral leadership. And I think the question is, are pastors, both large P and small P, more like actors or more like people? Now you think of your theological training. For those of you who have trained to be MDiv and for the, some of the students that are here for pastoral ministry, were you trained to be yourself or were you trained to be somebody else? Some of you have been in churches, not the one you're in now, but the one you left. Some of you have been in churches where the pastor is more like Meryl Streep than anything else. Because he or she has lost a capacity to be themselves and is in fact playing a role. They're really acting. That's what they're doing. It's one of the reasons many young pastors, and if there's younger pastors here, this may help you with your own anxiety, it's one of the reasons many young pastors are so anxious. Because they believe that in order to be a good pastor, the whole task is to not be themselves. And my experience in training pastors over three or four decades is to recognize that those pastors are people often who will leave ministry before ten years because they're tired playing a role and they're not being themselves. So what are pastors? Is being yourself antithetical to being a pastor? Or is it one and the same thing? I love Mae Sarton in her, po in her poem, uh, written a number of years ago, and she says this, describing this developmental process, she says, Now I become myself. It's taken time, many years and places. I have been dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces. There's nothing more wonderful than somebody who's in their 60s, and when you're 58, uh, older for the purposes of this week, will be 60 and above, but one of the wonderful things about older people is to find an older person who is now themselves. There's no more pretense. There's no more acting. They, in fact, are themselves, and they carry themselves that way. And intuitively, you pick up an integrity and authenticity about them. You may not particularly like the way they come across. You may not particularly like the way they communicate, but you have an intuitive sense they're being themselves. They're not playing a role anymore. They've, it's taken many time. It's taken much time. It's taken many years, and it's been to many places, but they're no longer wearing other people's faces. Now, this is more complex for pastors, I suggest to you, than accountants or truck drivers, or taxi drivers. 
Because when you're in the role of pastor, whether it's as a lay person or somebody who's in the office of a pastor, this gets more compounded because for many people, the role now informs the person. Uh, it would be unusual in your church, as it would be in mine, for somebody to go, Hello, Jill, computer salesperson. Hello, Bill, used car salesman. But many of us in this room feel comfortable saying, Hello, Pastor Bill. Right? You would never say, oh, this is Lawyer Jane. Uh, this is Dr. Bill. You know, we tend, don't talk about that way. We don't, in our nomenclature, in our greeting of one another, we often don't put the occupational title as we're talking about people. With, with pastors, we do. And some pastors actually like that. They like to be called Pastor Jill. It, it sort of gives you a sense of identity. And if you're new in pastoral ministry, it actually adds to your confidence. It may not add to your competence, but it adds to your confidence. See, if role informs person and person doesn't inform role, then it gets confused, right? And many of you have been in those difficult church splits where the pastor is confused as to whether he or she is having the role inform the person or the person informs the role. And often the result of that is a real disconnect with the community because people don't know who they're dealing with. This is compounded even further because these roles are public and people have expectations. I remember in pastoral ministry people telling me, how I should be doing my role. It's one of the few professions where non-experts are experts on your role. Right? <laughs> and that creates great confusion when you're actually in a role that you've trained to do and other people who've never, ever taken anything in that area all of a sudden know what you should be doing. So now you've got the role, you've got the person, and now you've got other people observing. And of course it's all public. Accountants don't have to stand up every Sunday morning and speak to the group they lead. And now you recognize that this identity question becomes very, very confusing. And those of you who studied social theory and have studied how self is formed, you'll recognize behind what I'm saying is a lot more material than I'm giving tonight. But of course, once we ask the question, who am I in this context of role and person and the expectations of the occupation, then we have to ask the question, whose am I? Because identity, in spite of what modern social science tells us, is not formed in the context of autonomy and isolation and independence. It's formed in the context of relationship and community. One of the great teachings of Trinitarian theology is that our rootedness as persons is its persons in community. So my sense of myself is not an intrapsychic analysis. It's not sort of rolling my eyes around and looking at what's going on inside me and doing an introspective psychological analysis. My sense of self is always in relationship. That's why all of us, when we move a great distance, we always feel disoriented. We feel destabilized. Why? Not because we're not happy with the move, but we feel disoriented and destabilized because all of our relational contacts are skewed. They're, they're out of perspective. It's not just that we don't have friends, but we've lost a sense of self because we define ourselves in the context of community and in the context of relationship. So when you ask the question, who am I, you must necessarily ask the question, whose am I? Where is my relational connection? Where is my self nurtured in terms of values and its beliefs and where it comes from? And therein, I suggest to you, lies the biggest struggle with identity. Identity is not an introspective contemplative analysis. Identity is a reflection of who I am in community and which community is actually informing my understanding of who I am. Of course, those of us in guilt-based cultures don't understand this as well as those in shame-based cultures do. That's why many of us in reading the Bible, when we hear, you know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, that we hear we're part of the people of God, we hear we're part of the body of Christ. As Westerners, it doesn't do a lot for us all the time because we don't see ourselves that way. We root ourselves intrapsychically, not in communion and in relationship. That's why community is such a difficult subject in postmodern culture. And so think of your own role for a minute, those of you who are in a particular role. Think of your first name, your last name, and your title. Sometimes when I come into my office in the morning, I see the sign and it says, Office of the President, Rod Wilson. And this may sound morbid or dark or black or I need a life or something, but sometimes I stop and look at that and think, which of those three really informs who you are today? 
Does office of the president dominate so much that people experience me as not human and inhumane? Does my own family of origin and all my work issues and all my Wilson issues that are just normal family issues like everybody else, does that inform what I do? Does Rod get lost because office of the president is above it? And do people feel like they're not dealing with Rod, they're dealing with the president? And some of us have been in those places and worked in those places. You work for the president with all of what that means. You see, this relationship between identity, when, when God says, I will call you by name, it seems to me he's saying more than I will call you by title or I'll call you by your family of origin. He's calling you by name, and it's in that first name where I find my sense of identity, my uniqueness under God. And if Rod doesn't influence the role and Rod doesn't influence Wilson, I'm going to get in trouble in my leadership role. I've dealt with many broken pastors over the years, hundreds and hundreds of broken pastors, and many broken pastors are broken because their first name has got lost under the title or under their last name. How do we understand identity, who I am, in the context of whose I am? Now let's reflect on this in two ways. I want to suggest to you that our identity, in the way that I've just described it, is rooted either in our human and broken relationships or in our relationship with God. Now, all of us were raised in dysfunctional families. I think one of the unfortunate parts of social science today is that dysfunctional families are only allocated to certain families. But you were raised in a dysfunctional family, and my apologies if that offends you. If you don't believe that, read one of the finest books on family therapy that I know, and you might want to write down the name of this. It's an excellent book. It's called Genesis. Um, and it's an amazing book on family dysfunction. And I find it funny with some of my friends, often they're from the United States, but not only from the United States, who think the family is going to get us through life. The family is God's primary medium to bring his help and to bring his grace and to bring his redemption. You often wonder if those people have read Genesis. You think you have problems in your family. Read those 50 chapters. You're looking pretty good about now. Uh, those of you who are teenagers at home and have a lot of sibling rivalry, you might want to read the first couple of chapters, see what the first siblings did with one another. Right? And you go on and on and on. We all come from broken families. We all come from families that have brought into us not inherent biblical values all the time, but all kinds of other values. All kinds of things that aren't consistent with who God is and what Scripture teaches us. Churches are similar. I know you shouldn't say this publicly in an event for McKay Divinity College, but on two occasions in my life, I've come close to losing my faith. Not because I believe that theologically, but because I almost gave up on Christianity. Not because of God, but because of you. Because of Christian community. Because of the church. Because the church became a weapon. The church became abusive in my own life. And it was so abusive and such a weapon that my experience was, if this is Christianity, if this is the exemplar, the manifestation, the expression of Christ's body, I don't want any part of it. I want to leave it. And so we pick up values in church. We pick up values in family. And we pick up understandings about things in our families that we always need to hold, biography, we need to always hold in tension with our theology. And so what are we given by our churches and our families? We're given a map. Every one of us in this room was given a map by our early church experience and our early family experience. And that map was given to us covertly, implicitly, and was given to us to navigate through life. You had one, I have one. I bring a map to life. It wasn't a Google map that, back then. I'm too old for that. But I was given a map. And that map helped me navigate through life. And the map was very simple for me. Love is contingent on behavior. If you want to be loved and accepted, you have to do certain things. Now, nobody was sinister. Nobody was awful. I wouldn't say my church and my family were abusive and I'm going to bring a lawsuit against them and charge them with being dysfunctional. They were, you know, parents had parents too, right? One of the great insights for children. Par parents had parents too. And churches have histories too. And I recognize that and I understand that, but I was given a map and the map was that love is contingent on behavior. Very simply, that means I do in order to experience acceptance. That's what I do. I do to experience acceptance. I perform in order to be loved. That's what I do. Nobody told me that. Those words weren't uttered, but that was the message that I got. What does that lead to? I is not acceptable. 
Now, some of you have been raised in really, really strong Christian homes and have got a brutal self-image, to use that kind of language, or have a very fragile identity. And one of the things you say, I don't understand, I grew up in such a loving, caring home, and I feel so insecure and so destabilized and so fragile all the time. What is that about? Maybe, like my experience, you feel that the only way you can achieve acceptance is to behave and to do and to perform. And you're tired of it. You don't want to do anymore. And if I can say this, and I don't say this in a sexist way at all, it's just my own clinical experience, many women, particularly in midlife, actually feel more and more frail and more and more fragile because they've been tired doing things to keep everybody else happy. And unfortunately, that's one of the negative byproducts of some parental situations where people feel the experience that they're always doing in order to gain acceptance, always performing in order to be accepted, and recognizing that doing always comes before being. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands tonight because we just met each other. Maybe I will later in the week, but I'd love to know how many of you are Wilsons in here. We didn't even know how to spell being. We did. We were doing people. And somehow, if you did, your being was secure. And what's this based on? This is based on a very simple balanced principle. Deficits in identity will lead to compensatory behaviors and performance. Give me somebody whose identity is fragile, somebody whose sense of security and well-being is frail, and I'll give you somebody who's often trying to compensate for that by working incredibly hard and trying to be diligent and do many, 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 many things. It's why if you were going to start a new company and you're going to hire ten people, it'd probably be helpful to hire eight insecure ones. Because <laughs> one of the things that you know is that if you get somebody who's feeling fragile and always needing other people's affirmation and always needing other people to say, I'm okay, one of the things they will often do is they will overbehave and overfunction and overperform in order to feel good about themselves. And much of the literature, it seems to me, on boundaries and some of these other areas where we're trying to limit our life and try to build in rhythm and balance into our life is not, in fact, about the amount of work we're doing, but it's, in fact, what is driving the work that we're doing. And often what is driving the work that we're doing is a fragile sense of identity and well-being that is trying to then express itself and overcome itself by overfunctioning and engaging in behavior that will somehow trump that experience. Pastors? Is it your experience? It's certainly my experience. Some of the most fragile, insecure pastors whose sense of identity and well-being is rooted in doing preceding being are often people who are really diligent, really hard-working, but get into lots of difficulty, moral and otherwise. That's not to say every case is like that. The case you may be thinking of right now, I'm not saying that case is like that. But that is often the trend because deficits in identity often lead to compensatory behavior in performance. Now what's the alternative? What's another way to think about this area? And there's a whole lot more we could have said about the human and broken relationships, but let's talk about our relationship with God. I don't always agree with Parker Palmer's theology as a Quaker, but Parker Palmer, I think, is very helpful in this regard. And let me read the quote. Again, you have it in front of you. Listen to the way he describes this. The God whom I know dwells quietly in the root system of the very nature of things. This is the God who, when asked by Moses for a name, responded, I am who I am. An answer that has less to do with the moral rules for which Moses made God famous, that's Parker Palmer humor for those of you who don't know him, than with elemental isness and selfhood. If, as I believe, we are all made in God's image, we could all give the same answer when asked who we are. I am who I am. One dwells with God by being faithful to one's nature. One crosses God by trying to be something one is not. Reality, including one's own, is divine. To be not defied, but honored. Now what's Parker Palmer saying here? Like Henri Nouwen, like Brennan Manning, other writers in this kind of tradition, simple language, 
real fundamental language, ontological language, for those of you who studied philosophy, a real sense, a deep sense of coming to grips with who I am. They say, ah, that's a little too obscure for me. Well, let me just give a personal illustration. Uh, my colleague at Regent College is here tonight, Maxine Hancock. Maxine Hancock's very articulate. Some of you have heard her speak. I'm on a faculty where there's a lot of really smart, articulate people. J.I. Packer's on our faculty. You know, he wrote Knowing God, right? I mean, that's, imagine writing Knowing God. And Eugene Peterson is on our faculty. You know, he wrote the Bible. I mean, it's just ama amazing. <laughs> Every time I speak in chapel at Regent College, I am traumatized in advance. Every time. This is my 11th year. Because when I stand up in the front and see all these very bright, articulate, well-known, internationally renowned scholars sitting there who have expertise in every single area that I'm talking about, I feel traumatized. And this lady, right here, my wife, will say to me, be yourself. Now, if you haven't been in pastoral leadership, you might find that illustration sort of, oh, that's cute. <laughs> Nothing like a cute illustration. It's not a cute illustration if you've been in pastoral leadership because you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is a big difference between recognizing who you are in Christ and then doing, then trying to do in order to be accepted. There's a big, big difference. And so many people in pastoral leadership do not believe that. They don't function that way. They haven't practiced that way. And many people have been in pastoral leadership for a long time, and they lost themselves two decades ago. And one wonders sometimes, when they roll over at night and say goodnight to their wife, do they say, Good night, dear, in a good pastoral voice. Right? It grips them so profoundly that they've lost a sense of who they are in Christ, that their identity is always up for challenge, and there's a dire to compensate for it. But what Parker Palmer says here is there's a sense of elemental isness and selfhood that if we're created in God's image, I don't like his use of the phrase, I am who I am, I would squabble with that theologically, but the point he's making is that who we are in Christ and who we are as God has made us to be, is not to be defied, but to be honored. If you're a pastor, one of the most profound things I can say to you tonight is just two words. Be yourself. You say, oh, that's more of that psychobabble stuff. No, it's not. It's not about psychobabble. In fact, I would argue many pastors who actually say it's all about psychobabble haven't understood the role of biography undergirding the way they function. Because if your identity is secure in Christ and you live out of that, who cares what J.I. Packer thinks? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Now Paul says that in, I find, a more helpful way in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at that together. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9. Here I'm going to be sermonic for a short time. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now one of the things that characterizes most evangelicals, maybe not the group in this room, but in most churches, is people read things really fast in the Bible. They're always reading quickly. And sometimes you hear scripture read up front and you think, did somebody say this was a race? Why are you reading this so fast? Read it slower. Ponder it. Reflect on it. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of God. Now all our friends who say, you know, we should forget the past. You know, we should obliterate our memories. We shouldn't be thinking about the way we were before. That's all gone, you know. Or, or the people who say, anyway, every time the past comes up. You have some I have a few friends like that. You know, you raise the past and say, well, anyway which in Greek means we're not talking about that anymore. <laughs> Paul was not like that. If you read the Pauline epistles, you will get a very clear sense that Paul was acutely aware of his biography. Acutely aware of his biography. And I recognize that Paul is the great theologian of the New Testament, but part of the reason he's the great theologian of the New Testament is because he's in tune with his biography. 
and he frames it properly. People who are into biography are just not these crazy social scientists. And this new center that's being inaugurated this week here at Acadia, I'm sure in this area and other areas of Nova Scotia, some people are thinking, oh, I don't know, you know, this, all those social sciences and chaplaincy and counseling and everything, I'm, I'm just into the Bible. Well, so will they be. Because biography matters. And Paul was not unaware of his pre-conversion state. He didn't say, oh, anyway, let's talk about theology. He said, I'm going to talk to you about theology by talking to you about myself. And if you don't believe that, read 2 Corinthians. It's his best biographical book. It's filled with biographical illustrations, not just to set up. It's not like the old gospel tracts. Remember those? Somebody tells a story and then a verse gets dropped. It was, it's not that. He actually tells his biography as the foundation for laying his theology. And that's what he does here in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of God. He did that in Philippians 3, 6, remember? As for zeal, persecuting the church. He's talking about being zealous. And he said, I persecuted the church. 1 Timothy 1, 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. And again, we'd want to say, oh, Paul, just you're past all that now. Remember Jesus, you know, remember the cross. He says, no, I was, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was a violent man. And Galatians 1.13, you've heard of my previous way of life, how intensely I persecuted the church of God. And if you actually read the Pauline Corpus, you get the distinct sense that he's a bit obsessed with his biography and all the terrible things that happened. Now, many of us with the so-called bad self-image might close the book there and say, I have biblical warrant for being down on myself. <laughs> I'm the least, I'm terrible. You know, you, some of you have friends like that. Every church has three or four of them. You know, you go up and say, how are you? Oh, I'm terrible. I feel awful. I think this is what Paul's doing here. But it's not what he's doing here. What is he talking about? What he's talking about here is his identity as an apostle. Notice he doesn't list all the things that he did. He says, I persecuted the church, but many of the statements he makes about who he was is a description of his very essence, his very identity. He says, apostle, I'm the least, I don't deserve. My apostolic identity, which if you know the Pauline corpus, will know is an extremely important argumentation for him to affirm the fact that he's an apostle sent by God. Here he's saying, listen, my identity as an apostle makes absolutely no sense in terms of what I was before because I was a persecutor of the church. But then he shifts. Look what he says in verse 10. But by the grace of God... I am what I am. Now, for all the Wilsons in the room, that's a phrase we need to memorize. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, if you pause at this particular point and think of all the things that Paul could have said in this particular argumentation, he could have said, you know, the answer to all my bad works is all my good works. Have you noticed that? Many older Christians will do that. You know, they're, they're so far past their non-conversion days, but they talk about all the good things they've done, all the wonderful things they've done. Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't answer his bad sense of identity with a whole bunch of good works. He also doesn't address his unworthiness with his worthiness. He doesn't go from, quote-unquote, bad self-image to good self-image, right? There's a lot of Christian, so-called Christian writing along that line, which isn't very theologically infused. You know, feel bad about yourself, feel good about yourself. That's not the answer. What he says is, by the grace of God, I am what I am. What is the answer to the church persecutor? The answer to the church persecutor is grace. He has had an infusion of God's mercy into the very essence of who he is. And again, if you're familiar with the Pauline writings, you'll know that's one of his themes in writing. Paul is always concerned with the identity of the Christian. Does he talk about what Christians should do? Yes, he does. But his obsession is with their identity. And his identity here is very grounding. The ontological essence of who Paul is here is a recognition that by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now let's translate that colloquially. What's he saying? He's saying acceptance is based on the absence of performance. Acceptance is based on the absence of performance. Now if I bring my biographical 
together with this particular text, and apart from hermeneutics and homiletics and Greek and all the other things that one might bring into this, just look at it in a very bald fashion, my apologies for that illustration, just look at it in a very bald fashion, what I come to realize is, what Paul's saying here makes no sense to me. To say that my very essence, who I am in Christ, infused by God's mercy and grace, I can actually stand and say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Not what I do, not how I behave, how I perform, what my profile is, any of those things. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, many people close their Bible up there, and there are many people like that, and this is part of certain segments of post-modernity and certain segments of the emergent church, not completely, but certain segments, where being now becomes deified to such a degree that you get the sense doing doesn't matter anymore. Some of you have seen that trend in the church. I have some friends like that who love being, want to be, They don't want to engage in behavior. They don't want to perform. They don't want to serve because the essence is of grace. And that whole movement, often younger than most of us in this room, has been very helpful for many of us because many of us who've been doing-oriented need to get back and understand the importance of being. But when you take anything and push it to an extreme, it becomes a problem. It's a bit like gluttony. It doesn't make food wrong. It just means you're pushing it to the extreme. It's the same thing here. And if you closed your Bible and said, by the grace of God, I am what I am, end of story, you, you know, just buy a red canoe and float down the Bay of Fundy. And just be. Read on. By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. Now one of our problems in evangelism is many times in our teaching on the grace of God, it is actually interpreted covertly as a passive acquiescence to what God has done, which keeps you passive. Grace is, in fact, a motivational, inspirational trajectory forward that moves us into a given realm. It actually results in doing. And the chronology of this here is really, really important. Paul does not say that you are are required to work to get grace. What he's saying is, in having grace, something flows from that. It has an effect. There's something that comes out of that. That's why discipleship and conversion are inextricably linked. And of course, in a specialized culture, we have books on conversion, we have books on discipleship, we have books on evangelism, we have books on discipleship. We separate them because we love doing that in specialized culture. But these are intertwined. Grace, as an undergirding foundation for the Christian life, expresses itself in something else. And notice what Paul says for all the Wilsons in the room. We love this phrase. No, I worked harder than all of them. Now you see, being gone wild leads us to the place we're all absorbed in our identity, but there's no effect coming out of it. What Paul says now is I work hard as a result of my understanding of that grace. The fact that my identity is infused by the grace and mercy of God, that doesn't, that doesn't leave me with a sort of a passive acquiescence of what God has done. What it does is move me towards doing and working hard. But notice the chronology. The grace precedes the work. And when that's turned around, we get ourselves in trouble. Now, is it any surprise, and I recognize there's some you know, debate in critical circles as to whether Paul wrote Romans and Ephesians and Colossians, but let's just assume here uh, that we'll take it the way it's written. Is it a surprise that the writer of the Romans, the writer of the Ephesians, and the writer of Colossians is saying this in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, and 10? I don't think it's a surprise at all. Those of you who know those three books, just go through them in your head with me. First 11 chapters of Romans, what's that? Identity. Right? Remember in your youth group, same in my youth group, we were all about, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to do something for Jesus. We've got to do something. For Always start Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, you present your body's living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the real mind that you may approve us, that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Remember that? It's like three out of every four youth groups. Was that's what we talked about. Romans 12, 1 and 2. The reason we didn't do anything before that, even though the first word in the verse of Romans 12 and 1 was therefore, we didn't go back and look at the first 11 because that was all about identity. And who's interested in identity when you're 18? You want to do things for God. And why do we have so many superficial Christians in the church right now? Because they start reading at Romans 12. 
when you read Ephesians. What is chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 4, 16 about? Identity. And why do we start? Many of us want to start, you know, looking at Ephesians 4. Let's start at verse 17 because that's where it tells us what we're supposed to do with all this stuff. It's not the way the book's written. The first four chapters, four and a half chapters, are written with a very careful treatise on who we are in Christ, and as a result of that, then we do. Come to the, first, come to the four chapters of Colossians. How is Colossians written? First two chapters, who I am in Christ, in the context of the Gnostic culture. And now, chapter 3 and 4, this is what it means. And so the word therefore, that's used in all three of those books, is an important word. And if our identity is not rooted and understood, and we start acting in Romans 12 and 1, and Ephesians 4 and 17, and Colossians 3 and 1, if that's where our Christian life starts, it's not undergirded by anything substantive. It's simply activity and ethics and behavior that have no roots. And I suggest to you, as a suggestion, not as a proclamation, I suggest to you one of the reasons we have so many ethical problems in the church today is because people are theologically bereft. They don't even know their way around the first 11 chapters of Romans or the first four chapters of Ephesians or the first two chapters of Colossians. It doesn't play well in a pragmatic utilitarian culture. Who I am in Christ, that's not very exciting. And all of a sudden you realize that many of us, including the person standing, many of us have learned the Christian life that's Romans 12 and 1 onward and we haven't understood Romans 1 to 11. For those of you who are faculty or staff or students at Acadia Divinity College, can I say to you, with this particular point that we're on right now, you are in important work. And never forget that. Because good theological schools recognize the importance of Romans 1 to 11 and the importance of Romans 12 to 16. Poor theological schools think it all starts at Romans 12 and 1. It's all about doing, it's all about behaving, it's all about serving. And sometimes, if I can say this at the risk of offending some of you, I read some Christian magazines sometimes and advertisings for schools and this kind of students they're trying to attract, and you get the sense this school only cares about what people do. And those people will burn out because they have no foundation theologically. So he says, I worked harder than all of them. And then you almost get the sense, I find humor in scripture, I realize that may offend some of you too, but you almost get the sense that he goes, oh, yep, but yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. You, know, you get the sense that maybe Paul was getting into this, oh, I'm working really, really hard, and I'm, I'm actually exploring this on my own and working really hard, and then he says, no, actually the work itself is what motivates me and what moves me on. Grace is the foundation for hard work. It's not the opposite of it. Now, I don't know what your view of the devil is. I recognize in the satanic realm there's different thoughts and convictions on this area, but I believe that that one of the primary tools of the devil in modern culture is to take the basic and the simple and make it complex. That's what he does in my life. If I was to rate tonight, in terms of what I've said in the last 45 minutes, if I was to rate this in terms of Uh, complex theological depth, I would give it about a C plus. It's not very deep. Not very hard. My hunch is, I haven't told any of you in this room anything you don't know already. But what I've talked to you about tonight is totally biographical. It's biographical in the sense that I've spent a lot of my life burned out in all kinds of ways because of a problem in this area. I'm aware of the fact that burnout has communal and genetic and personality variables, but my own experience of burnout has been around identity and performance. I would prefer to think that my burnout is because I have too many emails coming in every day. And I sort of like that sort of sociocultural phenomenon, like people will say, you know, around Regent College, how many emails do you get in a day? And we used to play that game in elementary school at recess. You know, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. It's the same thing. More emails, the better off you're doing, you know. Boy, did I ever work late last night. Huh, you worked late last night. Right? All those things. Oh, I worked four nights this week. Oh, four. I worked five. (laughs) Have you talked to anyone in the last five years who says, wow, I'm just real relaxed, not working that hard, pretty pretty simple. I, I haven't met somebody like that. 
Even retired people sound worse than those of us who get a salary. <laughs> and what I have come to realize in my own life, that the reason I'm burned out is not because I have too many emails. The reason I'm burned out is not because I've got practical, you know, pragmatic problems, I can't figure things out. The reason I'm burned out is because I have started, metaphorically, a lot of Christian ministry at Romans 12 and 1 and not at Romans 1 and 1. I have not built a strong foundation under what I'm doing. What I have done is done and performed and behaved. And what's undergirding it is not substantive. And it's fragile. And it's suspect. And it's destabilizing. And I hate with a passion what Parker Palmer says about people like me. I hate it. Every time I say this quote out loud, my stomach rumbles because I hate truth staring you in the eyes. But I read it to you in conclusion because this, my friends, is Rod Wilson. One sign that I am violating my own nature in the name of nobility is a condition called burnout. Though usually regarded as the result of trying to give too much, burnout, in my experience, results from trying to give what I do not possess, the ultimate in giving too little. Burnout is a state of emptiness, to be sure, but it does not result from giving all I have. It merely reveals the nothingness from which I was trying to give in the first place. Amen. Thank you very much. Please express your appreciation to Dr. Wilson. Thank you. I guess I usually ask for that after the questions and the answers, but I thought I'd ask for that right off the top tonight. We'll have... Um, I feel better. They like me. Yeah, you go. Good. <laughs> I'm going to moderate a little bit in terms of uh, questions and answers, and I've uh, been instructed to ask you, if you have a question, if you would please go to the, to the mics. We have a microphone there and also one over here. And for those of you right in this area, I can help you with, um, with this microphone as well. And then following uh, some question and answers, I'm going to ask Dr. Jansen to come and share some announcements with us. But we have a question. Please go ahead. It's on? Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. I like and agree with what you shared. Um, as I was sitting listening, I was also hearing some of my mentors from a few years ago and uh, thinking that is there some value still in trying to um, emulate a very good role model, someone that you like and admire, whether it's a senior pastor or even someone from the Bible. Um, uh, is there some real value in trying to sort of grow into the job of being a leader or you know, uh, something like that, just by seeing how others do it, and I'd like to be like him. Hmm. Good question. Um, is the question recorded? Should I repeat it, or does... Um, you okay? Okay. Um, yeah, good question. A couple of things on that. Um, I think what's driving that is important. I think what's behind it, I mean, the reminder in Hebrews uh, 12, you know, talking about those who are leaders among you, whose faith follow, uh, you know, Paul in Philippians 3, uh, be a follower of me, even as I also am of Christ. So a Christocentric approach to imitation, I think, is appropriate and biblical. Um, so that's the one side. And I, and I think there's definitely a place for that. I mean, I think there are people who are godly that we need to follow, and I think the Bible encourages us to do that. I think the danger in Western culture right now is the evangelical heroism that has gripped the culture in the last 30 years, uh, where we have uh, uh, big names, so-called, you know, um, Christian heroes that have got, you know, videos and seminars and workshops and books and, you know, five good messages they bring around the world sometimes. And there's a whole, uh, there's a whole cultish component to that 
where people are finding their sense of identity in the other that is not actually following what they're propagating. Uh, and I'm not going to name names here, you can think of some of the people, but often the followers of these big name people get themselves in trouble because they haven't done the hard work that those people have done to get where they are. So a lot of people, I think, will follow somebody in terms of where they've ended up, but fail to realize they didn't get to that place without a lot of work to get there. And that kind of imitation, I think, does get us in some trouble. So that could, I think that can become a problem for us in, in imitating others. But there's no question as we're growing and developing and learning that happens. One other thing I would say just in terms of learning theory, um, there's a, a way, I'll just do this real briefly for those of you who studied this area, but all learning involves four steps. Uh, the first step is unconscious incompetence, where I don't know what I don't know. Second step is conscious incompetence, where I know what I don't know. Next step is conscious competence, where I do the right thing because I know it's the right thing to do. And the last step is unconscious competence, where it's just naturally part of who I am. I think the move from the second to the third, the move from conscious incompetence, where I think, oh no, I don't know how to do this, to conscious competence often requires imitation. We, uh, I've taught some people to play golf. So do you, do you play golf? Okay, so if I taught you to play golf, I would say, you know, you're like this, and you're like this, and this is how you set up to the ball, pretend there's a stool back there. And if you came up here and did this, like you'd look really strange doing it, right? Because I'd say, do this, and you'd do it, and you'd say, this feels so mechanical, and it feels so awkward, and it feels so uncomfortable. Well, you're imitating me. You're being consciously competent. You're doing this because it's the right thing to do. But eventually, if you get through this stage, when you come up to a golf ball, you'll just do this too. And it'll be unconscious competence. And I think in that stage, imitation often helps. It's, why, it's how children develop. Imitation is very important for the development of children who look at mom and dad and copy them. Uh, which is, for those of us who've had children, it's a little scary at times, but uh, that imitation happens there. So I think there's a good side and a dark side to that. Yeah. I guess I was thinking also just of um, imitating, in a sense, those whom we know, and they might not be a, you know, a well-known Christian leader. Um, I've admired so many sweet old ladies and old gentlemen uh, sitting in the pew over the years who have had such wonderful attitudes, uh, really persevering in their, in their faith and walk with the Lord, going through such hard times. And we can all think of some of those names. And um, yep. I've often thought to myself, I'd like to have their quality of faith. Yep. Uh, so we look around and I guess we look for role models in a way that uh, we might be able to follow in their footsteps. And they, they give us inspiration. Yep. And I think there's a real value in that, at least, yep. you know, somewhat. Good point. Okay, thank you very much. Are there other questions? Yes, please. Could you come to a microphone, please? Okay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, I was raised with the concept that uh, Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, new spirituality teaches that uh, there is a oneness out there. And science teaches that the only constant in the universe is change. So getting back to that uh, quote uh, that was in the first paragraph, uh, we're created in the image of God, how does that relate to identity? What is the image of God? And what is that in the human? If we accept in science that the only constant is change, then how could Jesus Christ be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Because if man evolves, and if we're created in the image of God, then God must evolve too, and that's heresy. So. Huh. I want to get a, a, an academic prospectus from Acadia Divinity School and give you a couple of suggested courses, but uh, a couple of brief comments on that, um, just within the confines of what we're talking about tonight. I don't want to take on science or evolution tonight. Uh, you need uh, experts in those areas. Um, I mean, there's two different, I don't know where you come from, so I'll just explain this, hopefully in a way that's not patronizing on the one side or too complex on the other side. Two general schools of thought uh, amongst others in terms of what being created in the image of God means. 
Uh, one is the more sort of functional sense, as it's sometimes described, that God reasons, God chooses, God feels, uh, God works, God engages, God has dominion over, and in creating us in his image, we have all of those capacities. Uh, we can, just as God has created, we can create. Just as God thinks and feels and chooses and emotes and engages with the world, so we can do that as well. And he's given us that dominion over the earth, and so we can engage in those things. Because of sin, uh, again, depending on who you read and where you are theologically, there's a relic remains, there, that image is tainted, uh, capacity is lost, but the image is still there. There's still something there that's good. Uh, the other uh, orientation, which I alluded to tonight, is more of a, of a Trinitarian sense that God is communion, that God is inherently relational, God is inherently social, uh, that the relationship of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, in fact, are a communion, are a community. And being created in his image means it is our responsibility to be in relationship with one another, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so that, that command of Jesus actually echoes right to the garden. It's not just something new from Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself, but our relationship with God and with others is part of who we are. And so the inherent relationality of the human race and the connectedness of the human race is what we're about. Um, and again, that gets tainted and hurt. But even for those who would believe, you know, and... Tulip, for those of you who know your theology, or five-point Calvinism, or total depravity, uh, not everyone's as bad as they can be. We've all, we've all got a relic in there of the image of God that gives us the capacity uh, to function as we are. So um, that's a very brief answer to a massive question. Uh, and if anyone ever stands up here and answers that question fully, you know they're not telling you the truth. Thanks very much. Thank you. Someone else have a question this evening? Um, what would you say to uh, an aspiring young scholar or academic whose entrance into a PhD program or a further program is intensely bound up, as, as far as I can tell, with your performance and what's your GPA, which may not necessarily be the most... A it, it's semi-arbitrary. I mean, it has some merit, but it's not... A true indicator necessarily of who who you are, but and I don't know. The entrance into these programs is intensely competitive, and if you're not high enough, then you're going to have to foot the bill for your education. And then you're, I don't know. Do you get my my question? <laughs> you you have a friend, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My friend, uh, yeah. yeah, vicariously yeah. is asking yeah. this question. Good. I don't know. That's my question. No, that's a good question. I do talks on depression sometimes, and people always get up and say, I have a friend, and then they sl slip in the personal pronouns. Like, I, I mean, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think identity uh, pushed in the wrong direction, and there's lots of it out there now, even in evangelical circles, pushed in the wrong direction, could do the, you know, the Red Canoe and the Bay of Fundy orientation. So I'm not going to grad school. I'm not aspiring to do that. But to me, identity is bound up in a number of things, including call, God's call on your life. And if God's call on your life is, and you know, that's a combination of a whole lot of factors, right? The, uh, sometimes it's a direct vertical call, sometimes it's an affirmation of the body, sometimes it's a deep sense of this is who God has created me to be, and, or some combination of all three. If God has called you clearly to be in the academic realm, to get a PhD, and to do that hard work that a PhD requires, um, while some parts of the Christian world will, where piety always trumps intellect, and there's lots of that floats around, right, that to be really spiritual is not to get a PhD, it doesn't matter what it's in, um, but if you really put your piety and your intellect together, your sense of God's call together with competence, and recognize that's what God's called you to do, I think Christians should work as hard, if not harder, than anyone else. And one of our problems when piety trumps intellect, it also trumps diligence sometimes. And people don't work hard. I remember being at a Christian college many years ago, and students would come and say, "You know, sir, I didn't do your, I didn't study for your exam because we were praying in the residence. Uh, can we get it on another day?" And I said, "No, you can't. To the exams, today, but we were praying. So, like, wh what is the exams this day? You didn't study. That's like, yeah, but we were praying. And and the subtext is because we're praying, that trumps all intellectual work." 
So good, hard, diligent study as a graduate student, if you have a sense of call by God to do that, I think your identity can, is, is deeply rooted in Christ and is expressed in that way. And while some of the political games of GPAs and scholarships and all those things are very much part of the secular culture, um, you know, the, the notion of being in the world but not of it, if you say, well, I'm not playing any of that game, well, then you won't get a PhD. But if you lose yourself in the meritocracy of modern education, then you're in trouble. Right? If you actually think, because you get a PhD, you're smarter than everybody else, or you're a better Christian than everybody else, or you're in the meritocracy game where because you have more merit, you're worth more, then you've forgotten grace altogether. So give me a godly PhD that undergirds that with grace, and you've got a good PhD. I think that's a great way to end our discussion period tonight. Thank you very much.